Hello everyone, welcome to Help! I think my wizard is a transsexual! Uh, I'm Charles Battersby. Uh, I'm a video game journalist, and I've been an out-of-the-closet cross-dresser for about 20 years. Uh, and I have quite a lot of experience with uh, transgender characters that I've created and played in many games, tabletop, and video. Uh, and here are our other panelists. Hi, I am Eric, uh, otherwise known as Shidoshi on the internets and other places. Um, I currently work for Electronic Gaming Monthly, aka EGM. I am the news editor over there. Uh, and I have also previously in the past worked for magazines such as Game Fan, uh, Play and America. Um, I do podcasts such as Warning a Huge Podcast and plenty of others. And um, I do lots of other stuff and panels like these. So... Uh, my name is uh, Tyler Black. I'm a psychiatrist at BC Children's Hospital. Um, Charles asked me to come and talk a little bit about this issue. Um, I'm sort of last minute, so I'm not as prepared as I normally would be. Uh, <laughs> but it's fun to be here, and, and thanks very much for the invite. Thank you for coming. Uh, now, Janelle Jaquez uh, and Rebecca Heineman, who were scheduled to be here there on the West Coast, they had some travel problems. Uh, but if you check out the Press XY website, um, Coming up this week, we'll have some videos that they created um, regarding the panels we're doing here at PAX East. Yeah, and to mention that, um, if you do go to PressXY.com, all of our previous PAX panels, both PAX Prime and PAX East, are up there in some form as far as, as well as links to all the guests we've had. So, uh, And right now, let's launch the discussion with why is it important to have transgendered characters in a video game anyway? And... Now, I'm going to take the uh, argument that it definitely is important that uh, as a transgender person, I love any game that gives me a chance to play a character that I can identify with, um, and whether that's you know a character that I can customize to look exactly like myself, or a character that can be specifically stated to be a transgender person, whether the character can have a sex change operation in the game, or uh, just happens to have a male voice put on a female character model. Um, you know, that's something that really makes me connect to the game. And I think a lot of other players have a similar experience of being able to create a fantasy version of themselves. Yeah, I mean, uh, connection is a very important thing. And, you know, we don't want to sit up here and demonize the uh, white male heterosexual. But the problem is that a lot of majority of games offered that as a main character. And you have a diverse selection of gamers otherwise who are saying, hey, where is our representation? I mean, if, if you do not see yourself ever represented in a game, you know, there's kind of a feeling inside you that says, wait a minute, maybe I don't belong to this. You know, maybe this is not where I'm supposed to be at. You know, maybe, maybe I'm not supposed to be gaming. Maybe a gamer is a white heterosexual male. So, uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of people, and I know my own experiences as well, is the fact that it can be hard to connect to a game you know, even if it's well written, even if the character is interesting, it can be hard to connect to a game if there is never you. You know, maybe you don't want you in the game. Maybe you know when you're playing whoever your shepherd is in Mass Effect. Maybe you're not saying it's it's you, Shepherd. It's you know like Shepherd you're creating, but there still has to be some sort of connection there with that character um, because unlike movies, uh, books, other kinds of forms of entertainment, video games are interactive and. They have to make that connection with you in order for you to get into them. Tyler? Uh, um, this is an, an important issue. Um, you know, I generally work with uh, children, and um, my, my experience with uh, people discovering not only um, their gender but uh, sexuality is, is this is a, uh, it's an ostracizing event to develop in your, in your childhood. Um, whether or not you're heterosexual, homosexual, asexual, um, feel like you're transgendered, um, uh, cross-dressing, these types of things, it becomes very personal. Uh, so when, you're, um, uh, so when you're, you're doing things that other kids are talking about, um, other things are enjoying, other kids are enjoying, and you don't feel part of that group, um, you'll feel isolated. Um, and isolation is a, is a risk factor for a lot of the mental health disorders that I treat, whether it's depression, anxiety, um, even suicide. And I'll be talking a little bit about uh, the special risks that people of, of transgendered or transsexual or alternate sexualities have uh, for, for suicide and, and other health issues. Uh, and there's a helpful graph to help uh, sure. define... This is, a, this is a cool thing. Um, I've only recently become aware of it. I, I don't know if many... Uh, have seen this before, uh, called the genderbred person. 
but the reason the reason this comes about, um, and it's getting a distorted a little bit. Uh, I think our VGA connection is off. Um, uh, the reason this comes about is because right now there's about 17 different labels that you could apply to someone. So LGBT is commonly what people know, but uh, the actual phrase right now is LGBTQI2S, um, questioning intersex and two-spirit are the other ones. Um, and, uh, uh, and there's actually um, about 10 other labels. Uh, but when you actually apply all 17 labels and you give people a choice uh, when they feel like they're not heterosexual, um, only about 50% of people say yeah, that label applies to me. There's, a, there's, a, there's about 50% of people who are developing or exploring their own sexuality that say none of those 17 labels describe what I'm going through. So the genderbed person is actually, it's not a scientifically created thing. It's gone through two versions. I think this is version one we're seeing uh, up here. Um, do you want to switch over to the PowerPoint, actually? Because sure. um, I think I have version two, um, which has uh, a little bit, both are cool concepts. Uh, but version two, maybe go backwards uh, about uh, five or so. One can you more. Sneak there peek? we go. Um, so you can see it's, it's, it becomes a little bit more complicated, but it, it divides someone up into four categories, their gender identity, their expression, their biological sex, and who they're attracted to. And allows you to put just on a scale, for example, under, under gender identity. Um, so I've, I've, put the, I've sort of filled out my own here. Um, uh, so I, I, I identify myself as a male. I've, n I've never considered myself anything else. Um, I'm not the most masculine, expressive dude in the world. Like, I'm not like, yo, let's go and get beers and stuff like that. So I put my masculinity down a little bit, and I'm a little bit more, maybe a little bit more empathetic than a lot of guys. I'm the sensitive type. So I've added a little bit of femininity and gender expression. Um, biological sex, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a male. I'm not the hairiest male in the world, so I, I dialed it back a little bit. And then I'm only attracted to women. Uh, so this is a continuum. This isn't, I'm not giving myself a label. This is just me saying who I am. Um, and when people are able to do this, 100% of people say, this is what I feel like I am. Uh, and so this whole idea of labeling uh, is something that, you know, uh, when Charles was talking about in the, the ability to add a male voice to your female character is not technically difficult, but just giving someone the option to do that um, opens up a range of possibilities that weren't previously there. Oh, and joining us now is Maggie Baker. Uh, Maggie, please introduce yourself. So... Please, Charles, can you prompt me on what I, just an introduction? Oh, we were discussing the uh, gender-bred person and the... I love the gender-bred person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we're discussing the vast spectrum of gender identity, of how people perceive themselves, gender expression, what they throw out to the world, uh, biology, and sexual preference, right. and how it isn't just a simple left and right dichotomy of male and female. Cool. Now, my only critique of the gender-bred person gender-bred person, is um, asexuality, identity. And that if you identify as asexual, this can be not, as ne not necessarily as, you know, that's like the one little edge piece, because I totally love the gender-bred person, totally love that little gender-bred. But that little, that's the only... Well, only certainly version bit. one struggled with. Version two, I think version you can dial two is back, much better. Yes. You can dial back the attracted to to neither right. um, and make yourself rather asexual um, and put yourself in the middle and say that I'm sort of more on the androgynous side. Um, but it's, it's an attempt. It's a good attempt. It's better than saying somebody's gay or transsexual or, you know, that makes people stereotype and things like that. I also, like, um, I want active sliders I don't know why. I just think. Yeah, like, I drew those. I drew the sliders in. I, it's it's so you, fun. Yes. Thank you for this. Uh, Eric, uh, thoughts on the genderbred person? Great. No, I, you know, you know, um, and we talked a little bit about this on the Friday panel. Is that they're really, you know, we kind of the idea was that you either were a guy or, or a girl, male or female, you know, uh, and the things aren't binary like that. There's a whole lot of in between, and that's that's fine, and kind of the argument was, you know, it's, it's just be, be who you are. And if you don't fit, feel like you fit into a certain label, that's okay, you know. A lot of times we're told that we have to be this or that, and you don't, you know. And if, if people don't understand your situation right away, then you can help them understand it. And if they don't understand still, then that's okay, you know. And, and just, just realize that, you know, I mean... Anything else in life, we look at the wonderfulness of life as how many options there are. You know, we don't have two colors. If there's only black and white, things would be kind of boring. You know, if, if there was only 
uh, pizza and sushi, just randomly picking two things. You know, after a while, we would kind of hate food. But you can actually get you can actually get sushi pizza now. Yes. So there you go. Uh, but there's they actually have that in Japan. I'm pretty sure when I was there. Mm. Uh, there's this wide variety, and so so gender, gender identity, sexuality, those things can be just as varied. Right, and now that we see that there is this vast spectrum, a multi-dimensional spectrum of gender and sexuality, let's look at how this is being implemented by game designers and how gamers are using the tools that game designers give them to create their own uh, fantasy worlds. Mm. So, so some of you may be wondering why I'm wearing two sets of glasses. Um, <laughs> um, and that's because one of them is... Um, this is the outfit worn by a character in Saints Row the Third. Um, woo! <laughs> so th- there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of games that do let you choose your character's appearance and create a customized character. Uh, Saints Row the Third is one of the few games where you can actually have a sex change operation in the game and have it be uh, acknowledged as uh, a official piece of the story that other characters will be aware of it. Uh, and you can also spend the entire game uh, with a male voice on a female character or a female voice on a male character. And after 70 hours of playing through Saints Row the Third uh, with a you know, wisecrack and transvestite protagonist, I had forgotten that it was a customized character and just thought I was playing a game about a smart-ass transsexual that uh, beats up people in uh, the city of Steelport. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I had a chance to talk to the developers of Saints Row 4 yesterday, and I actually brought this subject up, and they said that previously, and I believe it was Saints Row 2, that you had a uh, reputation that you would gain from your, the clothing you were wearing, and what they said was they decided to not do that anymore because they didn't want to tell the players what was right and what was wrong as far as clothing. Mm-hmm. They wanted to give the players a chance to decide for themselves, and it you know, I, there are always things in games where we can say maybe this could be done better, you know, maybe this was a little questionable. But I think Saints Row really is an interesting series because, you know, they, they really enforce the fact that they want the player to say that whatever they want their character to be is okay. And they specifically go out of their way to, to be careful in not gendering pronouns. And this has been an special, especially an issue for the next game because, of course, you play as the president – and we usually have, you know, Mr. President or whatever, so they've had a rough time with that. But they are really putting in a great effort to say, you know, whatever you want to make your character, that's okay. And we're, we're not going to penalize you in-game, and we're not going to have other characters talk down to you because of the choices you've made. So, Yay. And, <laughs> and now there's a uh, tricky situation where... Some people think that merely addressing the issue of being transgender at all is only suitable for mature audiences. Uh, and I kind of disagree with that. Yes, I, I think there will be a very intense debate. Um, I, I think that it would be terrific to have a children's game or a tween game where one of the characters doesn't conform to traditional gender roles uh, and that's not inherently sexualized or fetishized that you just have a girl that does boyish things or a boy that does girlish things or someone that really doesn't care about gender at all. Well, scientifically as well, um, you know, what we know about childhood development is, is um, sexuality develops somewhere in teens. Uh, gender develops much earlier really than early. that. Um, if you see a three-year-old, that's, uh, a three-year-old boy that's wearing a lot of heels and putting on mom's dresses, there's a chance there's a, there's a, a transsexual inside that boy. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so this idea that it's an inherently sexual thing, it isn't. It's an identity thing. It's who I am. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, some people will pervert the science to say that, you know, um, this is an alternate thing. In fact, I'm a psychiatrist. Our, our DSM used to include um, transsexualism mm-hmm. as a mental health disorder. Um, <laughs> I had that addition 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah it wasn't, it wasn't uh, I don't think, till DSM-4, I think, that it, yep. it became, um, uh, it, they removed it as a disorder. Um, so there's always been attempts to make this an abnormal thing. Uh, but everything we know about development is that everything's on a spectrum. Some people are very, very masculine. Other people are very, very feminine. There's a whole range in between. 
Um, and sexuality, when it develops, is a later thing. Gender is not. It's an identity thing. It's a who am I type of thing that probably establishes as early as three or four years old. Yeah, really, really young. Yeah. Um, I'm a game designer, and I'm a sex ed teacher. And so both of those things support exactly what you're saying. And from a game design angle, like there's a, one of the things I love about being a, a tabletop role-playing game designer is that I'm leaving all the character creation in your hands forever. And you know, if I was doing video, I'd have to do some graphic thing. I'd have to figure out there'd be different hurdles around that representation of how I wanted to structure that. But as a role-playing game designer, um, I can design a game for teens. Uh, my games I run, which was d developed mostly in summer reading programs with junior and senior high school students. And looking at putting gender coding and how people express gender and attraction and orientation and all those things uh, really, really in the hands of the player. And then supporting through my game design and through my text uh, that all are awesome you know, whatever's authentic to you is awesome. Play the heck out of that. Um, and I think that it's a shift. Like the, the video games that the two of you have mentioned and brought up, you know, these are, these are shifts. We're beginning to see shifts. And thank all the great green googly mooglies for that. And now it's, while it is great that game designers will let characters choose to play a transgender character, there's also the question of uh, game designers creating characters that may or may not be transgender and refusing to actually mm. make a commitment and say this character is definitely transgender. So, um, of course, if you were at our, our panel last year, I talked quite a bit about her, but there is the character of Poison, uh, Capcom's character, uh, who was originally, yes, she, hey, she's great, uh, who was originally in, in Final Fight, and she was this totally nondescript character. And to give you a very, very brief background, the, the urban legend goes that when the game Final Fight was being brought to America, somebody said, hey, wait a minute, we can't let you beat up women. That's, that's not a good thing. So they thought about it, and they're like, well, what if she used to be a guy? And they were like, oh, okay, then you can beat her up then. So, so <laughs> Why does that make that okay? Right. <laughs> oh, my God. So, you know, the exacts of Poison's history are, are still a little muddy, but the, the fact is, is for 20 plus years, Poison was considered to be a, a transgender character. And uh, Yoshinori Ono, the current, uh, or was the producer for Street Fighter 4, you know, he went on a record a number of years ago saying, yes, she is trans. She is this way in Japan. She is that way in America. But either way, she's trans. That's the way it works. Unfortunately, um, Fortunately, the, the groundswell rose up and we got Poison into Street Fighter Cross Tekken, which was a very, very awesome thing. Unfortunately, and I don't want to completely blame Capcom for this, but Capcom at some level decided that they did not want to get into the argument of whether or not she was trans, so they changed their official position from being that Poison is transgender to, well, Poison is whatever you decide her to be. If you want her to be a... a real woman. She is a real woman. If you want her to be trans, she is trans. And the problem with this is you have 20 plus years of a character being a certain way. And then when you make her a major character in a game, you decide that we don't want to get into that argument and we, we don't want to bring up the controversy. So we're going to distance ourselves from that conversation. You Poison as a character, you know, there are not a lot of great representation uh, for transgender characters in gaming, Poison was one of the few prominent ones that we had, and then basically she was taken away. And the entire argument of whether or not it's important for gaming games to have transgender characters and whether or not it's important if Poison is trans gets weakened when people can now say, well, Capcom says she can be a girl and I want to fap to her, so now I can feel comfortable yeah. fapping to her because I'm going to say she's a, a, a girl. You know, it's uh, fap is a euphemism yes. for those of you. <laughs> so there's a danger in it. There's a danger. It's it's like can you imagine if we had a character who had who uh, a, a black character uh, who had been around for five, six, ten years, and then all of a sudden a company decides we're going to make him white instead. Well, like what if they made Storm white? Like suddenly right. the next comes out like Marvel's whole new thing, and now Storm is white, and be like. Yeah, you know, be, because we don't want the controversy. And again, I, I don't want, I want to be careful about what we say about Capcom because we don't know their internal 
conversations about this, but still that problem and this issue with poison is out there. And there's also, oh, you were about to say something, Megan? Well, I just have really strong opinions about that as a game designer. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Because, like, the, the, what, you know, we can't, you're right, we can't say things about what Capcom's internal process is. But part of it, as you mentioned, is the thing of, like, we don't want, we don't, we don't, it was a marketing decision. They made a marketing decision there of like whether whether they wanted to stick by their character uh, or whether there was a marketing decision involved in backing off from that. And uh, the unfortunate reality is when you give the players the choice of saying whether or not a character is going to be a, mi a minority, they're not going to pick the minority option. They're going to pick whatever they want for themselves. <laughs> but the great thing is uh, gamers have the option to do the exact opposite even if... Uh, even if the game designer doesn't say that this character is gay or this character is a transsexual or a transvestite, a lot of gamers still know in their hearts that Commander Shepard is a male-to-female transsexual when they're playing that game, and, and that... Your, your Commander Shepard is a male-to-female transsexual? Oh, yes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, game designers have a term called emergent gameplay when they didn't intend for something to happen, but players will do it anyway. Uh, and so we've created the term emergent gender play, where you know if you want your character in any game to be a transsexual or transvestite or gay, and it's like that in your mind, that's something players are going to do anyway. And it's awesome when they do. Like I love that. You know, if I in games that I have designed, and to watch what people do with gender. Uh, is really cool because it's another level of ownership where they are are engaging themselves in a creative process that I've sort of given a little set of tools to structure the conversation. Maybe I raised some questions of like, what would it be like if? And to watch people go into that space, and especially when I see emergent gender play over the course of a, of a campaign or when I'm reading people's actual play write-ups online, and they're going to like, whoa, one of our characters just came out last session. It was so cool. <laughs> Yay! You know, go you! Because it's, it's, it's part of the, the cultural shift we're seeing. You know, if, they, if they're able to have, be playing a game with all cisgendered characters, and then over the course of play, they're having emergent gender diversity happen, and that's affecting them in the real world as well, because now they have... Uh, some experience of like thinking about these questions and thinking about people in a more diverse way and having those also be awesome people that you want to know and play and are totally capable amazing people yes, and unfortunately sometimes when people do use their game character to come out or even just explore a new identity this can lead to very dangerous uh, um, very dangerous um, I guess consequences. Yeah, I mean it can be really, really challenging. That's that's the flip side. Yes, hello. I know. I, I, I think real quick there is a one danger as well is the fact that um, we uh, we have to be careful about trying to uh, take a character as our own when they maybe not. Um, and a good example of this is the character of Naoto from Persona Four, mm. and the game presents Naoto as being uh, female to male, and a lot of the community. Uh, assumed that, but the reality of the situation is if you play the game to the fullest, that is not who she is. She is actually not trans. She had uh, more personal issues with family issues and what she thought a detective could and could not be. So we do have to be careful about, uh, about trying to, and I don't want to use the word steal, but appropriate, you know, uh, characters when they are specifically not Transgender. I mean, when we have a custom character, you can make that whoever you want to be. But there is some danger because there will be pushback from the other side saying, wait a minute, you, you know, you're know, you arguing about us taking poison from you, but you're taking this character. You know, And as, as awesome as Naoto is and as awesome as she would have been if she was trans because of the, if she would be a great representation, she's not. So, And uh, about the dangers of discrimination when people sure. do try to, to push in one yeah. direction? Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting... Um, uh, I come from Vancouver, BC, um, in, in Canada, and uh, and right now in Vancouver, um, if you're if you go to school, if you're in high school, and somebody does something and they screw up, and you go, "Haha, that's gay," uh, you're expelled. Um, if you you can reapply uh, in in two days, um, and if you ever do it again, you're never coming back to that school. 
Uh, so it's, yeah, it's pretty incredible. Um, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to go far outside of Vancouver um, to find a town or a city where you could say that and the teacher would laugh. Um, uh, and, you know, the type, of, the type of discrimination that we see uh, that people of alternate sexualities and really minorities in general um, encounter, um, it, it isn't just a minor thing. Um, you know, I, I'm giving a talk at four um, on uh, video games and parenting, um, and I hate online gaming for the, the verbiage that's mm. used when you play online, that ha, die faggot, or the nigger stuff, or things like that. It's just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, it's really a black eye on gaming. Uh, but it's not, that, it's not even at that level. Um, if, if I'm playing a game and someone calls me, uh, you know, um, uh, you chink, and I'm like, I'm not Chinese, it doesn't, doesn't really offend me. Uh, but if I was a Chinese person and someone said that, even if they don't know me, it's going to hurt me more personally. Um, and kind what's really interesting, <laughs> what's really interesting about the, um, the mental health risks of discrimination um, is that they're actually profound and major. So if we just go to the next slide. Um, there aren't a lot of studies on transgendered people. Um, there's a lot of studies on, on what we call LGB, um, so it's literally lesbian, gay, bisexual, um, and there's not a lot of science on transgendered people. Uh, but this one article I pulled out um, I thought was interesting because it does talk, uh, they actually did a recruited study um, in San Francisco of, of, of a number of uh, transgender people, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so what we know is that LGB people... Um, are more uh, about three or s- three to six times more likely to attempt suicide, as well as three or more three or six times more likely to die by suicide, um, and uh, and that they're d- su- subjected to the type of discrimination that we used to hear about um, in the civil rights movement. Um, you can't eat here. You can't work here. You can't be here. You're not allowed to dress like that. You're not allowed to exist. I don't want you eating the same food as me. The type of you know human rights stuff that we used to see in the 50s during the c- civil rights movement. Mm-hmm. Um, this study actually um, was unique in that instead of recruiting a very small online self-selected group of people, they just went to all the th- places they knew in, in San Francisco where people of transgender orientations uh, would hang out or associate, so groups, um, societies, uh, clubs, these type of things, and they just gave them these 1-800 numbers. Hey, if you ever want to do this study, call us. They were able to get 515 participants. Actually, they got about 600, and they had to exclude some um, because what they were looking at um, it was the effect of whether male to female or female to male made a difference. Um, and, uh, and the results were actually pretty uh, disturbing. Um, yeah, so when, when I talk about discrimination that people of transgendered orientations have, um, it's not minor stuff. 60% reported having a history of being sexually assaulted. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's an incredible number. Um, it, it's about f- four times higher than the, the, the uh, average female and about 20 times higher than the average male. Mm-hmm. Um, verbal discrimination, um, 83% saying that they've been verbally discriminated against. Physical discrimination, which included assaults, um, uh, li- literally being assaulted for being gay, um, uh, for, for being transsexual, sorry, uh, 36%. Um, and, and having attempted suicide, one in three had, had attempted suicide, uh, which is about two to three times the rate uh, that we would see in, in cisgendered people. Um, the younger the person, the more likely they were to report these things. Mm-hmm. So the actual number of, of self-reported rapes um, in the under-25 group uh, was 83%. Um, and so it's not really getting better yet for, the, for younger people of the transgendered orientations. Do you, oh, do you think that the, j- just in terms of the study, uh, the increase in reporting from the younger population uh, do you think that means it wasn't happening in the older population? It's, it's hard to say. Um, you know, the, these types of studies don't give us a lot in terms right. of answers yeah. um, because we're not, we're questions. not selecting the population right. from an early stage. And so the um, younger people might be more comfortable reporting it. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, uh, what, what, what was really striking about this study to me um, is that this, um, this, this provides the numbers that we would traditionally associate with a high-risk group. So if I wanted to target someone and say, hey, we want to talk about depression or suicide prevention or something, the transgendered group hits all of the notes that we would look for mm-hmm. um, in, in a vulnerable population. Mm-hmm. So when, you're, when, when, a, when a vulnerable person is being picked on, um, they're already at the edge of the waterfall. They don't need a lot more to push them over. I always say mental health is like a bathtub. There's a faucet at the end of it um, that's adding water, and there's a drain. Um, and when the bathtub fills, we'll all 
you know, lose our mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and if your drain isn't big enough, um, you, you're a poor coping, this po poor coping skills, um, you know, it, it'll fill up quicker. But if you're getting a lot of stress, if the faucet is turned on too high, it'll fill up as well. Um, there's, some, there's some really strong transgender people I've been there who have experienced stuff that I would never even want my worst enemy to encounter. Um, and they're, they're going along fine. But we do know that these people have just a stronger faucet. They, they've been experiencing a lot more their whole life. I, I, I'm sure um, even just walking around PAX, Charles has gotten more looks than, than some. Than <laughs> Well, I, I tend to have a uh, Ayn Rand, Howard Rourke mentality about it. So <laughs> if people don't like what I'm doing, they can get out of my way. <laughs> Yay! It, it also helps that my costume includes this. All right, but uh, a great question we can explore right now is what can the gaming community do to help with these issues? That it isn't just a question of hurting people's feelings, it's a question of people can kill themselves because of being bullied and harassed and people can get assaulted and murdered just for being a transgendered person. Mm -hmm. So what can you as a gamer do? And some games uh, will have um, segregated communities where they have a all gay chat room or there will be all gay lesbian transgender uh, clans and forums and some games will even go so far as to have a special server or an area of an online game that's designated as the gay friendly area or the trans friendly area uh, and some companies have gotten into trouble for doing this uh, most recently electronic arts uh, they do Star Wars, The Old Republic Online, and they did an awesome thing where they had a whole planet which is designated as the LGBT friendly planet where you can just go and do whatever you want. Uh, and they got nailed by both sides with conservatives screaming, you're sending the planet of the gays after our children. Oh God, oh God. <laughs> And, you know, the, uh, a lot of uh, LGBT activists um, were angry because it's the equivalent of having a CD bar on the edge of town where everyone goes to cruise. Yeah. And yeah. so what are thoughts on integration versus segregation? It's, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, were you going to go? I'm just all excited about the idea. And I have two, I have two like, oh, this is how you can do change. But you go first. No, I was going to say it's, it's, it's a really, really tough choice. And, and I don't know that there's always an easy answer. Um, because on one hand, you know, as we talked about on Friday, you know, I mean, look at female gamers in the gaming community. Look at how much they are still struggling for acceptance and being respected, you know. You know, oh, girls don't game, you know. Um, so if we can't even fix that yet, how do we fix it for, you know, the LGBT community? Um, so there is a lot of, of, of potential in saying, okay, here's a safe place for you to go. You know, here's a safe place for you to, to find other people who are like you and who won't you know, judge you or ridicule you for who you are. The other side of the coin, though, in kind of uh, some of the things that I've experienced is the fact that there is a danger in kind of locking yourself away from the rest of the world, you know, and in saying, I'm going to go find that safety net. I'm going to go find people who are like me and, and who won't judge me at all. You kind of do lose a little bit of the reality of life and the fact that you are going to encounter that out there. You are going to encounter people who are not like you and you have to figure out ways to deal with those people. So it's, it's, you know, it's tough. And, and I think it kind of in my experiences, um, I've found that I, I tend to gravitate back more towards the all-encompassing world. And yes, there are real jerks out there, to say it politely. Um, but that's kind of the real world. And that's like, you, I, I don't want to lock myself away and, and kind of cocoon myself and then not be ready to deal with what's going on out there. And so it's, it's, it's tough, and I, I said I, I, I don't, personally, I don't know that there's an easy answer of if there's a better or if there's a worse, and maybe the option should be for both, but, you know, with the Star Wars gay planet, um, it does kind of feel, it does kind of feel like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna give you, you know, like the kind of Native American situation, we're gonna give you your little, your little territory mm -hmm. in this world, go, go mm -hmm. be there. Don't go, bother anybody. Yeah, go live your life and let the rest of the normal players just do what they want to do without having to deal with you, because letting letting the majority not deal with the minority is not a solution. That's never going to be a solution. The, the, the majority has to be forced to deal with the minority. Now, maybe not violently necessarily in, in my feeling or, or not, you know, 
that kind of way, but if we don't force the majority to deal with the minority, there's never going to be integration, like real, true understanding. Oh, and just for the record, uh, Electronic Arts didn't call it the gay planet. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just a planet with the regular Star Wars names that, uh, that's been you know, uh, acknowledged as the gay-friendly world that, that you can go to. So I think that in the question between integration and segregation, I'm an integrationist. Uh, I think that you know, the things you just read, like we all live in a world, and this is the world we live in. And I don't want people to be comfortable in their little boxes while other people are uncomfortable in theirs. And part of that involves changing my little microculture. And that means, you know, when, um, forgive me, but to step up and say, you know, that's not cool, you know, using words. You know, it's like, can we just not use derogatory terms? Yeah. You know, and it's, a, it's cool, cool. All right, yeah. moving on. It's not like a giant confrontational thing, but like the level of force can be really tiny. It doesn't have to be like with, like, you know, as up in arms as we can sometimes feel about these issues, because we can feel really up in arms about this. Like, we want these things changed now, yesterday, 20 years ago, before Stonewall, please. You know? But since we can't necessarily do that, changing microculture, going, so when something happens, you see something, say something. You see, like, like the kids in Vancouver. I'm like, you know, that's not cool. And maybe we, we're not in a place where we can say, okay, you are now expelled from PACs, although maybe they are, and wouldn't that be neat? <laughs> but point is that if we have a place where we have um, the courage to say, hey, that's, you know, let, let's just not use that way of dealing with other people whether it's homophobic or you know ethnically generated or gender binary whatever all these things but there's a key here and you brought up the safety issue which I think is important so when you're going about changing your microculture whether that's like your five people who you game you play D&D with every night and you have for or every night wow every week <laughs> um, okay D&D online and you play every night so whether it's just those five people or whether it's a place like, like this and this whole room, you know, if, if you're feeling scared, because it, it can be dangerous and it can be revealing and it can be really dangerous. Like there are people who, for, for whom stepping out, even as an ally, can be dangerous. So a thing to do is like find one other person, one other person to be an ally. So like there's this person over here. There's a person over there. I don't want to point at anybody. There's a person, person over there who's being really wicked homophobic. Can, can you? Can we go? Just tell him to chill that out. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So the place this happens to me is people um, cosplaying um, Nazi SS guys, and that's heavy duty. Mm -hmm. And like I've run into a couple. You know, this was years ago, thanks, because they've stopped. Because there's a microculture of people going up and saying, "Really? You're, it's not even like from a." You're just straight up playing a Nazi. That's not so cool. I'm going to go over here and do this panel about awesome stuff now, but just, just keep that in the back. I'm not like getting up in their face. So that's the thing, to address the, the safety issues and the integration issue, because we don't have to be massive confrontation, although I think there's times and places for that, and that sort of social disturbance and that sort of activism, yeah. but a way of integrating and saying, hey, we're here too. And we're all just, we're human beings, so let's just treat each other with compassion. And, and generally, you know, any experiment with segregation has not worked. Um, right. That's apartheid. Um, and, uh, you know, gay apartheid or whatever. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it is, it's not, it's not a solution. It actually will increase conflict. Um, and de it'll mystify something that should be normalized. Um, a lot of the work that we do with kids um, uh, whether it's talking about mental health issues or sexuality, is to normalize, to say it's okay to experience what you're going through. It's mm -hmm. okay to be different. Mm -hmm. um, and and, uh, and that, that's integration. That's not segregation. So. Um, I, and I, I know you talked about the, the safety, you know, being, making sure you keep your safety when, like, kind mm -hmm. of trying to speak about things. Um, I'm going to harp on this point over and over and over again until I'm blue in the face, but... We can't have my problems and your problems. You know, we have to have our problems as a society. What 
do we need to fix? How, how do we make things better? Because if I'm just worried about myself and I'm not worried about your issues or what you're going through, then you know that's very selfish of me. And I, I know it can be very hard because we all have super huge things that we're dealing with and it's a struggle for just for ourselves to get through it. But I can't sit back and say, you know, I'm, I'm not black. So when I'm online, I hear somebody called the N-word. I'm not going to say anything because I'm not black and it doesn't affect me. I can't, I can't say that, you know. We, we, if, you're, if you're male, you can't say I'm not going to worry about a female gamer, you know, being called names and being told she's not a real gamer because I'm a, I'm a guy. You know, you, we can't do those things. We have to come together because we are all gamers. We should not be stabbing each other in the back. We have to come together and say, look, we are, we are a we. We are not, we are not an I and a, and a you, you know, we cannot just worry about our own issues. We have to support each other in this and make the gaming community and, you know, hopefully the entire world in some little small way a better place. Uh, and on that, uh, Tyler has to run to another panel. So, thank you guys for having me. <laughs> thank you, Tyler. Um, but we would also like to throw open to questions. Um, if you want to tweet a question to um, press XY uh, at a, uh, on hashtag press XY, and you can also line up in the center, and we'll start taking questions. Can and I? Is there anything else we want to get to before questions? Um, do we want to talk about self-identifying? Well, people are lining up. Can I say one thing? Up, of course. Following up on what you said, because yeah. I thought it was brilliant. Um, in terms of being all us, we're all we. Like one thing we know how to do in this room and at this convention, all seventy thousand people at PAX, we know how to empathize with someone who is not ourselves. We know how to play a character. We know how to really feel for that bit of pixels on the screen. So if we can't step from that space to feeling empathy for other actual breathing human beings, what is up with that? Now that's the, the griefer mentality that it's just some little elf on the screen and there's yeah. not a real person attached right. to it. Right. So if you kill them and take their stuff, it doesn't matter. Right. And the, which is crazy, right? Because like one of the we're online like recognize there's someone else on the keyboard at the other end and they're a human being. Uh, I just want to say real quick before we get to, comment, uh, to questions is the fact that um, while we all do have to work better and help each other in this, don't feel like you have to go beyond you know, your personal uh, safety space. Um, because, for example, uh, it was previously against the rules for Xbox Live to mention that you, that you are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. Uh, you would be kicked off of Xbox Live if you mentioned that before. Microsoft has since changed that policy, so now that if you do want to announce that, that's great. But don't feel like you have to do that, you know. Do whatever is comfortable to you. I, I mean, there are some of us who love to speak out and talk about these kind of things, and if you want to have the fight be a quieter fight for yourself, then, then be okay with that. And if you want to be out there and loud and proud, great. But, you know, just, just be what makes you feel comfortable and don't feel like you have to be a martyr or representation for any kind of community at all. And uh, let's jump into questions. Okay, so I, I just have a question about the uh, segregation versus integration. Um, is that more of a just allowing the communities to have freedom to set up their own kind of like areas that they would like? So instead of having instead of having like a reserve where people are allowed to be at, they can if they want to, they can set up a spot somewhere else, and then this is like their community. It's still sort of a form of segregation because it's all they're all together, but it's just they have the freedom to do that. Is that what you mean by that, or uh, yeah? Right now, game developers are you know they're exploring different ways they can do this, and sometimes that's just having an unofficial gay-friendly server or allowing uh, players themselves to create uh, their own clan that can be whatever that clan wants. Um, so at this point, it's mostly uh, unofficial LGBT-friendly areas or allowing players to create their own LGBT-exclusive areas. Mm -hmm. uh, and as far as I know, there is no uh, company that has a uh, official gay reservation <laughs> where you <laughs> must go after you know failing the gay test or. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, so right now, it's, it's pretty much just you know player choice yeah. and developers yeah. exploring you know the right thing to do with very small steps. Yeah. I, I think forced segregation is bad, but for example, we have the upcoming GamerCon. Uh, GamerCon. Yay, GamerCon! Uh, yes. You know, 
I, 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 I'm not totally in love with the name, but I love the idea. Uh, and I, I love the idea that, you know what, we can have that community there and we can have things, events like that. But I think it's when it's forced. Like, you know, if you have a game where it says, okay, yeah, if, if you're LGBT, you have to play on these servers. If you are, yeah, not you know, cool. not, you can play on these servers. I think that's where things get really scary. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, good, it works. Uh, yeah. Earlier you had talked about, like, uh, how everyone would just treat you normal in a game if you were, like, transsexual on, like, you know, Saints Row or, like, um, Mass Effect or something. But don't you think this might cause a problem where perception versus reality, where the reality is people really are made fun of, and instead you could have an option where someone could make fun of you and you could either A, try to talk it out rationally, or B, beat the crap out of them? <laughs> that would be awesome. Uh, if, if any game designers are listening to this panel, it would be terrific if um, they could have a scene where, or a mission where you have the option of fighting bigots or I, I don't think there's a lot of game designers that would want to have a mission where you can ally with the bigots. <laughs> but, but it would be terrific if there was an option of have a reasonable conversation with yeah. a jerk or just kill them on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, we have, yeah. we have, a uh, we have Ashley, thing of, like Ashley how you, space racist in Mass Effect, you know, so. Oh, Do you yeah. Know, the, we, the, uh, the panel I was on, part of why I'm like, hi, I know you, um, <laughs> is do, dealing with... Uh, nonviolence, like nonviolent conflict resolution, and that there's ways that you can do awesome, awesome structuring of your your stories without there being uh, horrible violence and harassment. So my, I love the idea that you could maybe talk them out of it. My only concern, especially for 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 people in the transgender community, is that games are an escape. You know, right. they're an escape from the reality of their situations, and, and games are a place where they can be who they want to be, not who they actually are currently in real life. So I, I, I personally have a little bit of a, of, of a concern saying that I don't necessarily want that in my games. I want games to be more of an empowerment fantasy where you know, I can be whatever I want, not just dealing with the same crappy stuff that I have to deal with outside in real life. So. Yeah, that too. Right. Next question. I have two questions. Uh, my first question is when dealing with communities online. Personally, like I've dealt with like more like verbal like harassment like online than I have in the real world. Because in the real world, when someone's saying something, I can just be like, "Really? That's all you could come up with?" <laughs> I like, come up with a better argument. But online, like people, since they can respond to you anonymously, oh sorry, since they can respond to you anonymously, there is that whole issue like you can't respond to them or you just see their comment. Like there's no way of really stopping that person. Mm -hmm. um, in your opinion, what would be the best way about handling something like that? Uh, if someone's being a, a real jackass to you in a forum or online, report them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, most uh, most big game publishers, they have people monitoring their communities specifically looking for uh, harassment. And uh, the major consoles and major uh, digital distributors will usually have some way that you can report a screen name uh, for harassing comments. And unfortunately, I think at some level, though, you, we don't do anything. I mean, there's that classic Penny Arcade you know, comic that we, I'm sure we all know about what anonymity in plus the internet does to people, you know, and, and I, and I, again, I don't want to go back to just play with your friends because that you miss out on a whole wide variety of awesome players. And I wish there was like some sort of like shock device in your controllers, so you, you know, <laughs> but. Uh, my second question was dealing with um, using games, uh, having like transgender characters or like gay, lesbian characters in the games like, as like, a learning device for younger children. As many people say that, like, as you mentioned before, like, should this just be an adult topic? In your opinion, how good of an idea is it? Like, well, personally, I think it would be a great idea to put mm -hmm. these uh, ideas in it since kids pick up gender roles and many social like, stigmas really early on. Like, do you think that would be a good way of going about teaching about these issues? I think it would be absolutely terrific if um, you know any of the game publishers making games for you know teens or children could address the issue. I mean, I think it would be wonderful, and I think it could be done pretty well and still have an interesting story, uh, interesting characters and gameplay, and just one of the characters happens to be transgender or non-conforming gender. Yeah, I agree completely. I think that, um, like the gentleman who was sitting here and is now invisible had said, you know, the ideas of gen like that when you. Constructing gender identity, even if, if it changes over time, and it might, who knows? Um, by the time they're in kindergarten, they have a sense of it, right? And we all pick up constant messages of what it should maybe do if we break down into binary, which we all know is crap, but everybody has to come to that understanding at their own time. 
I think it's a fantastic idea. I think there should be more portrayals of gender spectrum issue, like identified people in like children's books and like ca cartoons and role playing games and little games of little. Why are we gendering toys? You know, could we get rid of the pink aisle, please? Or keep the pink aisle, but make some of them guys. I was gonna say I I I like, you know, I like the it's pink just, aisle. It's like, I, I, that, that's right, why yeah. I just said I got clapped over. But like, or keep the pink aisle, but make some of them some of them guys. You know, <laughs> no. why not have it everything be for everybody? And so this is a place where when you look at designing games for for elementary school kids, right, in the sort of seven to ten range, they are incredibly acutely profoundly aware of gender issues it, like exquisitely painfully aware of gender issues and when we acknowledge that first of all here's the thing lots of people think sex is scary when we equate gender identity and gender presentation with just sex it makes lots of people like want to scream and run out of the room when we can unlock the two, like in the gingerbread, the um, genderbred person, when we can unlock the two a little bit and realize that your gender expression is an expression of yourself, and that may include attraction and action and all those things of sexuality at some other time. But for kids talking about gender issues, yes, we don't have to be talking about like, and then there was this surgery and it did this. It's like no, just picture the, your character, little. Eight-year-olds and little, little eight-year-old girl with pigtails and a, a jeans and a little eight-year-old boy with a cool stripy dress and a little eight-year-old boy in red shorts. Moving on, why is that a problem? I, I, I think, just shoot real quick, uh, two things. Um, being somebody in the media and seeing how games are presented, I think the gendering of games is complete BS. You know, you, why do we have guy games and girl games? Why, you know, games should be for everybody and, and just... Put them out there and say whoever's going to come play them, play them, and that's that's great. Um, the other thing is, you know, look at look at how we're still with the gay and lesbian issue. How that's, you know, that was originally oh my god, it's all about sex. They just mm -hmm. want to go out and have sex, and that's all that 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 culture is. And we're getting past that, but we're still not completely past it. But we are making small steps to say no. Being gay or lesbian is far more than just what you do with the genitalia you have. You know, so I think that we having quite got to the transgender part of that yet, and that's going to be another long struggle of, again, because so many people still think that being transgender means, okay, that this guy is gay, but he feels bad about being gay, so he's going to become a girl so that he can have sex with guys, you know? There's still that, that deep misunderstanding of what it means to be trans, so it's going to be a long time before we can get past that it's just a sex-related thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question. Uh, hi, I'm a solo independent developer, but I'm developing something more along the lines of an arena shooter that doesn't really focus on the character as much. You know, you generally, like if you play Quake or Unreal Tournament, is kind of choose, you know, a male character or a female character. And as a player of those, I haven't normally considered that really an issue, you know, personally to me, but do you consider an issue, you know, for yourself, if you're going to play something like a Quake or Unreal Tournament, you say, hey, you know, I choose a female character, you know, do you want to take it a step further than that? I mean, but if it's just kind of like a, I mean, no, here's the character biography, does that do enough for you, or do you really, you know, want it really integrated into the game in a way that it feels correct to you, I uh, guess? I would just say this is a big, big thing for me. If you're going to have any kind of character creator, even if you don't see that character in the game, always give the option for gender, always give the option for race, mm -hmm. always give the option for body type as much as you possibly can. Um, because there are too many games that... that like, I've played still so many shooters where you can only be a guy, and it's like, they're like, well, but it's not realistic, you know, because there wouldn't be a female out there. But no, it's a game, okay? Come on, give me a break. You know, not everything has to be real. So at the very least, I mean, it's still complex about how you integrate all this in there. The very least, give those choices to players, even if it's a first-person shooter and you never see that character outside of, like, a menu screen. Can we talk about um, Portal for just a second in that regard? And like this is an amazing game because of that, because the primary character is female. And even though you're from the first person, and you don't really know, and you don't really have to know, but like my teenage sons and all of their teenage guy friends, you know, they all know that this 
character that they love, that they've invested in, that they're playing as, that they're like working through stuff with, that they're playing this totally badass woman. Hmm. You know, that is awesome. You know, I would, in ways, but rather, if you're going to default, default to something that is not a cis het middle ed- middle class educated white dude who's of a certain religious orientation. Um, <laughs> go beyond. Like, if you're going to have a default, and I th- like, I would say that if you need that, why? But if you need that, look for a default that is outside the expected default. Always question if you need a default. That's yes. what I definitely would say. Yes. Is always ask that question. Why? You know, I mean, like, if I'm playing Uncharted, I want Nathan Drake because he's awesome, and that's just the character I want. But 95% of the time, otherwise, I don't think I need a default character. So yeah. really consider that option. And next question. Hi. So um, I'm a bit loath to defend EA because they've certainly had some missteps in their past. But um, the the case of the gay planet is really a situation where uh, certain members of the professional media were trolling. Um, this this is completely factually inaccurate. Bioware has committed going forward to being more responsive to the needs of the gay community to include. Um, ways to opt into officially sanctioned gay content um, which will be presented and available to all players uh, to choose or not choose as they please Um, and and as a process of moving forward with this um, they're introducing it in all of their new content the first of which will be an entire planet which has you know um, myriad opportunities Um, it, it will be the first planet to also include these these uh, same-sex attraction opportunities as well. So, I mean, uh, I'm afraid there's not technically a question here, but we have to be very careful about, you know, uh, castigating them for this. This was really a, a, a positive step for them. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's a, a situation where they're developing. And, and to be clear, you know, I know more about the Capcom issue. That's why I was saying I want to be very careful about saying what Capcom did or didn't do is, let's be clear, Bioware has done a lot of very great things in this regard. You know, so we, we don't want to say that they're this evil, evil right. you know, company mm-hmm. or, or developer or whatever. I think sometimes it's just it's more a question of you know, certain issues can be out there where, where maybe it didn't go the right direction. You know? uh, so I, dev- I agree with you. you know, we have to be careful about not saying that bad, Bioware is a bad guy in this situation. It's one of the things, like, just, like every time there's a step forward, it, it brings with it more questions. And that's the part where I think that you know, it can be a great step. And kudos to the whole decision-making process that this step happened, whether it was emergent uh, community building support among community members or an official company policy. It doesn't really matter if it's a step forward. It's going to raise more questions. And that's the place that I want to keep asking the questions and keep, you know, keep them in mind. What's the next step? Oh, and uh, it, we did another panel on Friday where we talked about... Um, uh, the gaming industry, and you know, we uh, we're not bashing EA up here. We in that panel, we talked about how the human rights campaign had given uh, Electronic Arts a 100% rating for having LGBT friendliness, and one of their subcategories is having specific policies for the transgender community. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, EA and Bioware, you know, they're taking a small step, and it's a great step in the right direction. So, I just want to make it clear, we're not bashing them. We're actually really happy with the work they've been doing. I had uh, two questions as well. Uh, the first being, I'm not sure how to uh, think about the planet of the games we keep talking about. Um, <laughs> because I'm not sure if that makes the area a big target. Is that uh, basically for bigotry people saying either, oh, you should be at the planet of the games, get out of here, or like people attacking that area if that's something that's possible for bigotry reasons, like, is that an issue that as, they've as addressed? A con- as a, using the, the, let's say, using the Planet of the Gates as more of a concept instead of just an actual specific thing, that was an issue that uh, Blizzard dealt with in World of Warcraft, and I, b- I believe where they, for a while, did not allow you to tag, or maybe they still don't, allow you to tag your, your clan as being LGBT, because one of their arguments was that we don't want to make you a target. And 
it's it's tough, but I think that you know what, as gamers, gamers should have that choice. It'd be like, you know what, if we want to be out there, if we want to be proud of who we are, and say f everybody else, and if they want to come at us, come at us. You know, like I think players should have that choice. Yeah, and I think any time a, a game company takes a step towards that, they are going to be making themselves a target for crazy extremists. Uh, and unfortunately, that's just going to be part of the growing process. And if we just keep keep taking the steps, eventually. Uh, it'll get better in time. All right. Uh, my other question was um, about uh, companies using transgender characters, for example, uh, and having an issue of creating caricatures. Uh, is that something that we should see as okay, like they're trying, or is that something people should be offended by? Uh, um, well, the offense, any offense should be proportionate to whatever the transgression is. Uh, in the 90s, the PlayStation generation, there were a lot of really offensive stereotypes and negative depictions of transgender characters. But in the most recent um, console generation, there are several games where a character is a, uh, intersexual or transsexual, and the audience doesn't know unless they play the new game plus mode or they get the special alternate ending that explores that character's storyline. And so those are the things that I like the most when, you know, you can play through the whole game and it really doesn't matter. It's just the character just happens to be a transgendered person. And I'm always wondering if some game designer has actually created a character that they know is a transsexual that's fully transitioned and it has nothing to do with the story, but the narrative designer or the character designer, um, they know it is and just never told the audience. And there's also, there's also a danger, I think, I, part of how I feel is the fact that there's been so many examples of bad transgender characters in gaming that I think, I'd love to see, like, maybe, let's say, a seven-year moratorium and say, okay, let's only have positive characters for seven years, and then you can get back to, you know, being a little more flexible. I mean, I, I hate to say that, but, you know, like, I, I just think that I want to see more positive trans characters before we get back to, okay, they can just be a normal character in the flow of your comedy and, and all that kind of stuff. Right, and we're a little past four. Yeah, yeah, now. I, yeah I was going to say real quick. Um, it, it's past four. I think we have a. You're, you're fine. Yeah, we have flexibility for answering questions. But if you need to leave and go to other stuff, uh, pressxy.com. Please go there. We have all of our previous panels up there, and these panels will be up. To, bye. Thank you mm -hmm. for coming. Thank you, Maggie. You are awesome. <laughs> yeah. So uh, and. So I said, if you, if you want to save and ask a few more questions, that's fine. But you can always go to our website, or you can hashtag us on, on Twitter. Um, I am always available for questions. I, I know Charles likes ask, answering questions as well. So you can hit us up on Twitter. Uh, our Twitters are on the PressXBuy.com website, as well as email addresses and stuff like that. So if you have to leave, there you go. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm one of the people that has to leave. I'm doing the Navigator panel in the Phoenix uh, Theater at 4.30. So if you want to ask some questions to Eric. I can, I can ask you a few more thing. questions. I don't know how great my answers will be, but I can certainly try. <laughs> all right, but thank you all very much for coming. And if you have any other questions, um, just hit the Twitter. Yes. I will see you later. Yes. Talk to you later. Um, oh, but, so first, you I just have kind of a. I'm sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, just kind of have a general comment uh, about the, uh, uh, the Capcom thing and how you said like it'd be weird if they changed the you know race of a character. Right. Capcom Excuse actually me. did end up doing that. I, I know who you're gonna mention. Yeah. Mention him. Birdie. Excuse me. I apologize for interrupting, but somebody lost their wallet. It's up at the soundboard. If somebody lost their wallet, please come on up to the soundboard. Sorry about the interruption. No Birdie is an interesting example because uh, that was a case of taking character from the majority and turning him into a minority. So I, and that's the one I always bring up because people always say there, there's there's a group of people out there who say um, we want Poison to be a real female because for for six weeks in her initial design she was going to be female, but then they turned her to be trans, and that was 20 years ago. But I don't care. I want them to go back to the original design. And I always say. What about Birdie? Birdie was white. He was a white punk from the UK, and now he's black. And I don't hear anybody, you know, saying Capcom needs to go back and, and be, be honest to Birdie's origins. So Birdie's a very interesting, you know, uh, mirror to the whole Poison situation. And then uh, my other question, um, trying to figure out how to word it, I guess. Um, I guess what my kind of question is, is like... 
I guess my, I'm kind of wondering how a lot of transgender people feel about having to specifically label their character as transgender, like it shouldn't matter what type of, I guess, genitalia they have. Like if, if a transgender person feels that they are female, then should being able to just play as a female character be enough? I mean, no matter what that female character, like, like, cause they don't even need to think about what genitalia right. the female character they're shooting people with is, has. It's an interesting conversation in games because I mean, you know, having gay and lesbian characters makes total sense, especially nowadays when we have more and more romance options. There's a very clear cut, this is how it's going to affect the game that you can see. Uh, with trans characters, it's not necessarily um, as present. And uh, yeah, unless your character is like taking their clothes off, maybe you would never ever know in the whole course of a game. I think it's just more about the representation. It's more about we, we you know what, even if it affects nothing, Give players that option just to check a little checkbox that says that. I mean, that's, that's not a great solution, but for now it's at least something. And just giving players any options they can for creating a character that they can more identify with. So, like I said, for now, maybe it's not going to affect very many things in a, in a game, you know. But still, again, it goes back to the kind of what I said before about the first-person shooter thing. You know, I don't see my character ever in first-person shooters, but I still want the choice to make that character to somebody that I can identify with. Thank so. you. Thank you. And our final question. It's actually not a question. It's more oh. of a comment and Uh-oh. feedback. But Uh-oh. I just want to say thank you. And invisible thanks to everybody, because <laughs> I think this is yes. a really important topic for all of life, but in particular in this community. Um, but my, my feedback was just um, to m- maybe in the future make it really clear, like, when we're dealing with things like being gay or lesbian or bisexual or asexual, that those are issues of sexual orientation and yeah. not of gender identity because right. sometimes people in the trans community feel really strongly that, you know, there are straight trans people and they're like, well, I don't want to be labeled as part of the gay community because that's not an identity that I share. Um, and just feedback for the future of like right. making that clear. That's kind is, of why I tried to point it out. And I, and I know it's tough sometimes to, to we're not as clear as we should be and that's yeah. a good comment to make but that's why I kind of said like you know it, being trans is not a question of, of who you want to sleep with it's, it's who you are you know the person in bed not the person trying to get in bed totally and so. uh, the specific the specific like feedback would be having that terminology and maybe like going over it really quickly being yeah. like this is the terminology that we're going to use so that everybody starts on the same page. We actually did that at our original panel last year here at PAX East, um, and I think that it might be nice to kind of, for us to, because we always have this struggle between who's going to be new to who's going to be here before, and presenting new information versus kind of going the same, uh, same stuff, but that's, that's a good point to make, is maybe we take like five minutes at the beginning and just say, here is a real quick, what is it to be trans? Because we, we really went into that in our first panel. So if you, if you haven't seen it or heard it at all, it is on the website that you can check out. Uh, we tried to talk about just the basics of that, but I will take that note under consideration and we will try better next time. Yeah, but just thank you, because like, it's important. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank, everybody who's here, thank you for coming. So I really appreciate it. <laughs>